Well, it's very nice to be here and to see all of you with your masks on. And forgive us for not having ours. We'll try not to infect you with anything other than some interesting conversation. Um, hopefully, I'm very glad to see my friend Ahmad. I haven't seen him in a long time. We were just that talking about that. It, it, we don't I, know how long it's been. We can't even like, remember how long it's I've been. I've lost track of time. <laughs> yes, yeah. me too. Uh, certainly from before the pandemic, right? Yes, Yeah, absolutely. yeah. But uh, Facebook keeps us in touch, I guess, <laughs> and talking on the phone. Uh, otherwise, you know, we're here uh, mainly to talk about documentaries, but this is going to be kind of centered on DocuNight, which Ahmed has been doing, which I think is really an amazing thing. And any of you who are not subscribers, definitely just go to DocuNight.com and and sign up. Uh, it really is a, a fascinating platform, and I don't really know anything other, any other thing really like it. Are there any other uh, documentary uh, things out there for other countries? Um, I'm sure there is. I don't know them, but I'm sure there is because yeah. this kind of uh, service and these kind of films, they, they tend to have a smaller audience. Yeah. Um, and it's a very niche audience, and the same way they don't know about document, I'm sure I don't know about them. <laughs> but I don't know of any big service that promotes documentaries the way we do. Yeah. yeah. Um, you were telling me the other day something about what sparked you to do this. You want to tell that? Sure. If, if you don't mind, let me just uh, thank Asia Society um, and Rachel for having us here and, and doing this program. I'm very glad that we could do the collaboration and bring these uh, documentaries to Age of Society. And if you like those films, please encourage Rachel to do more. They have screenings every week. They can add more Iranian documentaries there. So thank you, Rachel, for that. Um, so yeah, the story was, um, there were two different stories that ended up me having these documents. The, I had a very fun, nice, touching documentary, the one that we showed actually today before this. Uh, my name is Negah Jamali and I make westerns that I loved and I wanted my friends to see it. Uh, so I would invite them over to watch it, but like there were two, three, four of them would come. I have a small apartment in, in San Francisco. Um, and then it would turn into a party, not dance party, but like people talking, eating, her, the cell phone would ring, and I hated that. And I thought I should just rent a a small theater and watch it on big screen. Uh, I wanted to do that for a while. But then another thing happened with what was happening in 2009. We were all very involved in, in, the, elec in the aftermath of the election back then. And I found, I found myself having a lot of opinion about what was going on without living there. This uh, is the uh, election in Iran, the, the stolen election, uh, yes, the presidential yes, election yes. in 2009. So in 2009, I left Iran in 2001. Uh, so it's been, it had been eight years since I lived in Iran, and I really had no idea about what was going on. And Iran is a very fast country. Things change. Even the, the vocabulary changes. Like I remember I was talking to some friends, and I didn't understand what they were saying, because there's a word that you know, but it has a lot of hidden meanings that you don't know, and those things change. Uh, so I, I thought, I don't really know what's going on in Iran, and I'm having these opinions. Um, and my information is limited to my very few uh, upper middle class friends in north northern part of Tehran, and probably some news websites. Uh, and I thought there should be a better way of, of keeping myself up to date with what's going on in Iran. And I, uh, after a while, I thought that's documentaries, because this is where you get a chance, when you have a chance to get a glimpse into people's lives in different ways. Like, nobody's going to talk to you about Negah Jamali and this guy who loves Western films. Uh, no news media is going to talk about that or, or other, other things. These are aspects of people's lives in Iran and everywhere else that, uh, that you won't see on CNN or BBC. Uh, so I thought documentaries are the best way. And with having this documentary, I thought I should... Uh, just rent a place. Um, I put a post on Facebook. I thought maybe we were like 20. The place had 40 seats, and I thought maybe more people want to join us. And 120 people signed up. <laughs> uh, so we had to move it to a bigger place. And then a friend from LA said, "Can we have this in uh, LA as well?" I said, "I don't know. I have to check with the director to uh, to see if I have the right." And he said, "Of course." And then another friend from Vancouver said that. And uh, so we started with three cities. Something that's supposed to be a small screening at my home started as a bigger thing. And I had no plan to, to make it big. But then I realized 
people are interested. Uh, people who were interested the most were actually students, Iranian students in American universities. Those are the people who reached out to me and wanted to watch these films. Um, so we started working with universities all around the US and then later on Canada um, to have these screenings. It turned, uh, it became a monthly screening um, in collaboration with universities and we went to five, seven, uh, and when COVID shut down our screenings, we were, we had screenings every month in 25 cities in North America. Uh, most of them uh, at universities, more than 20 of them at universities, uh, no tickets were sold, it was all, um, we raised a little money to pay for the rights of the screenings. Um, um, and some, some places that we sold tickets, it was to cover the, the, uh, the cost of the venue, like in San Francisco, we showed it at the Roxy, we had to pay for the yeah. venue, but in other places it was all free. That's how it started. Right. Um, well, you curated uh, the, the series, you curated, you were the one who chose the films, and so you, you had to keep up with what was going on in documentary filmmaking in Iran, and what was that like, and what did you learn in doing that? Um, it's a good question. It's a, the first few months, they were very easy because I had a lot of documentaries that I loved yeah. and I thought it was very easy to choose them. Right. But then after that it became difficult. This is before, we started in 2014, internet was not as fast, especially in Iran. Uh, so I had to get my films on DVDs. Uh, I had to, I had I had to ask people to send it to people in Iran who were traveling between Iran and the US to bring it, the physical DVDs to me, things like that. Uh -huh. um, and then I had to go through these set of DVDs to find the ones that I thought they were right. Um, the, the challenge, the biggest challenge was keeping it fun for people to come, yeah. so people would come, yeah. at the same time informative. Right. Uh, most of the documentaries that come out of Iran they are, that I saw back then, they were about the challenges, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and there are many. Right. So uh, it looked like we are showing a dark side of Iran, yeah. which was not the intention, but most of those documentaries are about the, the challenges anyway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so finding a, the right balance was not easy. And then we had to make sure that we cover all topics, like, um, women's issues, music, cinema itself. Um, we had from the early on, like this, I think the third film that we had was uh, about newspapers and being shut down and all of that, and reporters, the, the challenges. And uh, so we had to, uh, women's issues, we had to cover all these topics. Uh, we couldn't have like three films about the same topic and not talk about the other ones. Right. So finding it was challenging, it is much easier now because everybody there, they have Vimeo and they send me links so it's easier to watch them. It's still going through the films and finding good ones is not as easy. Uh, but now that we have, actually now that we have the streaming service, it's much easier because the, it's a different standard, yeah. I would say. It's not necessarily they're bad films, but there's some films that have limited audience. Yeah. Um, now I can afford to put it on, on streaming service that I couldn't do it on. Or monthly screenings. Yeah, uh, let's talk about the conditions of uh, uh, documentary filmmaking in Iran now. Yeah. Uh, how many uh, film? How many documentary features and documentary short films get produced per year? Um, and I'm also interested to know what you know, what kind of freedoms or limits the the documentary filmmakers have. Yeah. Um, so what I'm telling you is not the official. Number. I don't know the exact numbers. Yeah. Uh, this is, these are the information that I get from my conversation with people there. Right. And there we have two numbers, the official films and then films that are made, but not, they're not shown anywhere. Yeah. Uh, either because of the topic of the film or the quality of the film. Right. So it is very difficult. Like I, I get links about films that somebody made about his family. Uh -huh. And there's a story there, but I don't know how, like it's not necessarily, I'm sure it's in none of the statistics. Yeah, the yeah. Um, but um, there's a festival dedicated to documentary cinema Harirat, uh, uh, festival from Harirat, cinema Harirat, that yeah. is uh, all the documentaries that are shown there, except the ones that don't get the permission shown, all the, all the good documentaries, all the 
relevant documentaries are shown there usually. Uh -huh. um, and numbers are different based on who's in charge, who's, the, who's running the government. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, things get easier and more difficult. But I would say anywhere between 40 to 60. Right. Yeah. Uh, and what kind of permissions do, do documentary filmers, filmmakers have to get permissions? Uh, or, or some get permissions and then some just don't and go around it? Like Jafar Panahi making his films outside the, yeah. you know, the, the system, you know, the official system. Uh, so if you want to, this, actually this is the way it used to be, that if you want to be sure that you don't have problem with showing your film, at least it's easier because nobody knows before it's finished, but right, right. Uh, you try to get permission. But I don't think anybody gets permission. If you want to deal with something that you have to, for example, one of um, the directors that I, I uh, communicate with a lot uh, is doing a film that he had to go to some governmental um, buildings, uh -huh. so he had to get permission for his film. Right. But if you're getting, if you're doing something that is not necessarily while shooting it, you don't have to have a permission. I think most people don't get permission for it. Right. Especially nowadays, that's very easy. Right. Um, to film something with digital. But the thing is, if you want to film on the street, for example, uh, there's a chance that they will ask for your permission. Wow. But usually people take a chance, and it's so easy to go around them. Right. I remember, uh, this was not about a documentary, but I was living in Iran back then when Iran and America had a, had a match. Uh, uh, there was a soccer, football match between Iran and America, and Iran won that game in Australia. And people were so excited that they came to the street. There was nothing planned beforehand, but. Right then, we were making a CD around what Iranian football uh -huh. or soccer, yeah. um, and I thought I should film this. So I went on the street and I saw filming people with a camera, and they stopped me and asked for permission. <laughs> I had a um, a card, a membership card from Film Khane Meli Iran, the National Film Archive, which has nothing to do with nothing. It's just a <laughs> membership card. I showed it to the guy. I said, "This is the, this is this is my permission." And look, I said, "Okay." So. <laughs> Um, so sometimes you get around with it, but then depends on your luck, what right. you're shooting, where you're shooting. Right. Well, I sort of had the impression from talking to people in Iran uh, one of the recent times I went that uh, some people are drawn, some filmmakers are drawn toward uh, uh, documentaries because there were just less controls and less restrictions than in fiction filmmaking. Yes. Uh, it's, it's not just a restriction, it's also because the funding that you need uh, for a nonfiction. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for a fiction film, for fiction. is is bigger. Yeah. And producers that invest in the film, they want to make sure that it's an investment. Yeah. That it returns. Yeah. Uh, so they ask for permission of that. With documentaries, it's not you don't have that. It's not that costly, so you can afford making them without having uh, a producer with a lot of money. It's much cheaper, so you can risk it. Yeah. But that's also another reason. Yeah. yeah. Um, and how do people consume documentaries or see documentaries in Iran, aside from that one festival you, you mentioned that is an annual festival? Are, are, there, are there theaters that show uh, documentaries? Uh, there are a couple of theaters, as far as I know. Again, I, I, don't, I cannot claim to know all, all the things from yeah. things that I get in the conversation. Is there, there are several cinemas that show documentaries uh, that are commissioned by the government, actually. Uh -huh. They show documentaries, but uh, it's limited. It's compared to non-documented, yeah. compared to fiction, it's much more limited. But the, I think it's more than here, I would say, more than the US, at least in San Francisco, where I don't know what's happening in New York. But, <laughs> well, but in San Francisco, we don't have that. Well, in, in, you know, in, in the US, um, in, in the 90s, uh, documentaries sort of broke out uh, commercially, and things like Michael Moore's documentaries, uh, Bowling for Columbine and Fahrenheit 9-11, were huge money makers. They were big hits and that sort of yep. opened the doors for uh, documentaries to be in theaters and art houses and such. And I think that, you know, that obviously goes on now. I didn't know if there was any equivalence to, to that. In, I, I haven't heard of yeah. anything. And, uh, and, all the top sellers that you see in Iran, uh, they're usually entertaining films. Yeah, yeah. That people go to take a break right. from their life. And, and do docu Iranian documentaries get much exposure internationally, especially at festivals? I, I know at places like Cannes and Berlin and Venice and such that very occasionally there'll be documentary films, but but, not. but don't they occasionally have documentaries occasionally. anyway? 
Well, occasionally have documentaries anyway. But occasionally. Yeah. No, no, I mean general. Yeah, in general. They, in general, they occasionally they don't have that many documentaries don't to have begin that many with. But, yeah, but you look at hot dogs. Yeah, hot dogs. They usually have one or two films from Iran. Right. Yeah, so if you look at festivals dedicated to documentaries, you usually see documentaries. Right. But again, it depends on the time because um, during the Ahmadinejad time, uh -huh. We didn't have that many films coming out yeah. because there were limitations, right. a lot more limitations right. for making films. Right. And then after that, we had a talk, we had eight years that we saw seeing a lot more documentaries coming out, interesting documentaries. Now it's getting more difficult again. Right. So I think in a year or two, we're going to see a lot less documentaries. Yeah. Documentaries that you see at Hot Docs this year, yeah. they were made before. Yeah. So next year, I think, I don't know if, it's, if we're going to have documentaries. Or well, I, I'd sort of gotten the impression that things were becoming more difficult for all filmmakers uh, yes. uh, currently, yeah. uh, which is really a shame. Um, but uh, also, we, you know, we went to uh, a great documentary filmmaker, film festival in the U.S., the uh, Full Frame Festival in Durham, North Carolina, where Abbas showed uh, ABC Africa. That's, and, that's uh, when I yeah, came so to America first. That's his first yeah. trip to the U.S. South. Yeah. And that was your first trip to the yeah, I still have the t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It says, um, how much reality can you handle? How much reality can you handle? That was the slogan yeah. of the festival. Exactly. Yeah. Well, speaking of your father, he is uh, one of the filmmakers most known for doing documentary work in addition to his fiction films. I mean, he, I don't, I was just trying to think when I was walking up here if there are <coughs> any other very prominent Iranian filmmakers who are known for making feature-length documentaries to the extent that he did. Um, and can you think because that's uh, a good question yeah um Rakhshan Bani Etamad Bani Etamad oh, yeah. Bani Etamad yeah. she definitely has yeah. okay. many documentaries yeah exactly uh, and then you have just documentary filmmakers like um Kamran Shirde exactly yeah exactly but then you have people who have made one or two documentaries actually one of the m most interesting documentaries that I I've seen in the recent years um, was a documentary by Kianush Ayyari called Newcomers. Uh, so last year we did a series um, of documentaries on the revolution in Iran that happened 44 years ago, um, 43 years ago. Um, it was called, there's a series called uh, a, Re a Revolution Televised and we tried to find all the documentaries that, the, that were made during those years or later on uh, uh, f documents that made about the revolution or there were some films that were made about the films that made f about the revolution. Uh, and one of the most interesting ones uh, was Newcomers by Kian Shayeri. And he basically just uh, started filming people on the street, what was going on. And there's so many weird scenes in that film that it's impossible, like you don't read about those anywhere about things that people were saying, like and then doing, uh, theater that they were doing, and the, so, uh, it, it looks like a joke. Like it's, diffi it's difficult to take it seriously. But this is what was happening then. Like, there, there's another scene, um, even if you don't want to become a, a member at Dark United, you can go and see it on Instagram. We have that part on Instagram. Like, there's a, <laughs> there were like 20, 30 young kids in a park gathering, just dancing. And saying something as the rach narubala mark barsha, like two things, like a very simple uh, folk song, but uh, they say one sentence of that, and then the other one is down with shah. They mix it up. It's it's so um, amazing. Yeah. Um, so then you have those occasional documentaries from big directors. Kian Shahiri, of course, is one of my favorite yeah. directors in Bob. Well, you know, sort of tying this uh, discussion today to the one that's going to go on tomorrow, uh, your father started out making films at Kanun, and there were certain documentary elements to what he did there and to what the other filmmakers that were yeah. working there. They sort of went back and forth between uh, documentary and more narrative or fiction filmmaking. And uh, so I, I think that's a, sort of an important thing in the way that it influenced what happened um, after the revolution, where Kanun continued to, you know, go on as an institution, and people uh, continued to tr come out of their sort of training in filmmaking. But uh, Abbas made uh, first graders in homework under Kanun's uh, auspices in the 
in the well, 80s. Also, uh, the citizen, Hamshahri. Yes, yes. Uh, but the very first one was Qazir Shekla Avash first case, second case, yes. or case number one, case number two. Right. Exactly. We don't know what the title is, find exactly. the English title. <laughs> yeah, but uh, that one, yeah. I think, is qualified as a documentary as well. Y yeah. Well, uh, yeah, that's one where it's like, is that really a documentary, case number one, case number two, or is it something, you know, strange category into itself? Uh, but yeah, he, I mean, he did documentary work. I, I mentioned those uh, first graders in homework because they're feature films that, uh, you know, it, it, as I said, I think Abbas was one of the rare filmmakers uh, that de dealt mainly in fictional narrative filmmaking, but also made feature length documentaries. Mm -hmm. um, and then he made Close Up, which, you know, people, is that a documentary or what? I mean, that's the film where it seems like everything comes together. Yes. And, uh, I think that was, you know, also obviously very, very influential. But it seems like the uh, Iranian documentary tradition itself really played into the narrative and fictional ones for a lot of different reasons and a lot of different ways. Yeah, but so when you look at his uh, his career, I think the the first document that he did was um, first case, second case, or case okay. number one, case number two. I yeah. don't know which one you should call it. Uh, it was that one. Yeah. Uh, which was planned before the revolution. Yeah, but was made after the revolution. I mean, right at right few months after the revolution, right at the revolution. Yeah. Uh, but then they kind of shut down cinema in Iran. Yeah. For years, Khan didn't make any, and then he did Hamshahri, which uh, is not documentary. But then he did several. The first long film that he did, longer format, was um, Hamshahri. Uh huh. The sorry, the, the I would say the first one that he did wasn't Hamshahri. I, uh, it was the chorus, the chorus. Ham Sarayan, right. Ham Sarayan, yeah. Ham Shari. and also the Tartib Ya Bedun Tartib. But these are short films for children. Yeah. Uh, but then he did Ham Shahri, the citizen. Right. Um, because it was more difficult to make films. This is my interpretation. Uh -huh. I might be wrong. I don't know. But right. Uh, because it was more difficult to make feature-length films in Iran, and those were challenges that he was dealing with. Uh, his short films, the stories always came from the challenges that he had in life. Like, I was going to school, things that was happening to me that I don't remember, but he, he, he found interesting, and then he would make a film about that, yeah. uh, that topic. But Hamshahri was about people trying to cut in and go into a, a part that they couldn't drive in. Uh -huh. um, yeah. uh, and Kanun was inside that area. Right. And people would come up with all these excuses, false excuses, to just get permission and go in. Right. Uh, and then he started making documentaries, like you said, first graders. But later on, when he stopped making documentaries, again, he made another one a few years later, ABC Africa. Yeah, exactly. Which changed the way he made films. Yeah. Because that was the first digital film that he made. Yeah. Um, and I think it's one of the first feature-length uh, digital films that were, that were made anyway. Right. He made in 2000. Uh, those, that's supposed to be just uh, visual notes that he took from his trip. Yeah. And he's supposed to go back and make the film that's later right. on. But yeah. then he decided to use the same, those footages and make his film. So right. it, it, I think documentaries changed the way he made films as well. It was a back and forth between what was happening, like, and then he realizing, oh, we can, I can do it this way as well. Right. Uh, and I, as you said, many people in Iran I realize those capabilities, I would say, and, yeah. and use it in the way that we're making films. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the earlier history of documentaries in Iran, especially in the 60s. There were a lot of short documentary films that uh, really established a tradition, it seems like, that helped lead to the, you know, the explosion of talent in the Iranian new wave in the 1970s. But I was wondering, do you have access to any of these films? I mean, Farouk Farzad's uh, film, uh, The House is Black, of course, is very famous, and that's been out there. But I know that there are a lot of other films from Ibrahim Golestan and from Kamran Shirdel, who you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, that were very important in that era, and uh, most of them short documentaries. Are, are mm -hmm. you able to access those? Does those fil are those films still in existence? That's a very good question, something that I've been working on for a long time now. Is, is that right? Uh, and this is one of those things that we couldn't show at the monthly screenings, yeah. but I hope to have all of them on DocuNight. I've been, uh, I've been trying to find ways. Uh, some of them, they don't have copyrights anymore. Uh -huh. uh, 
but they are in bad condition. Some of the films that we found for, from the revolution, um, including a film by um, Amir Naderi, uh -huh. we had to do a, I can't recall the restoration, but we did some digital enhancement uh -huh. to make it look better. Yeah. We did the same thing with Kionush Ayori's film. Yeah. Um, we have all of Kaman Shirdel's films, all of them. Wow. Uh, and we didn't have anything, uh, Film Khane restored those films. Uh -huh. So, uh, and Carmen Shirdel generously gave us permission to put his films on the, on the platform. Uh, I've been trying to get Khosro Sinai's films. His son is here and he was actually the person who was running um, Dark Unite um, somewhere in the, in the East Coast. Uh -huh. I think he was in MIT. Uh -huh. uh, so I would try to get the permission for those. And I, uh, Nasser Taghwai is another one. Uh, does, he has very important films. Yeah. So I'm working on it and I hope to have, I, I've been um, pulling some strings trying to, to get those films and I hope that I can. I hope so too. And yeah. does the National Film Archive in Iran have these films? Yes. Yeah, that's they, what they have. It. Yeah, but it's, they're, they're kind of a strange organization, aren't they, as far as getting access to things? Uh, it is, and I have to say that the lady who's been running it for a long time, she's done a great job. Oh, good. Because it's not easy to have an organization like that and have it there all these years. Yeah. Because something comes up and they shut down the organization. I think she has done a fantastic job. She has a lot of limitations about what can come out, what right. cannot come out. So that's the strange part that you're right. talking about. But there have been screenings. When I was in Iran, like I said, I was a member of this uh, film archive, Film yeah. Khane. Yeah. Uh, and they had, I don't remember, monthly or weekly screenings of films that usually you couldn't watch in Iran. But we had the special screenings that would go from Buster Keaton, old Buster Keaton films, uh, to more recent ones that you couldn't show in Iran. Right. We would watch those films there. Yeah. Uh, so they have all the old films, and they have restored many of them. Right. Uh, like I said, the Kaman Shida films. Right. And I hope, uh, I hope they do something with it. Yeah. Well, there, a lot of those older films are really fascinating, and if they could be accessed and put out, it would really be great. Yep. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> uh, and it made me think of case number one, case number two, because I was writing something about that recently and, uh, and realizing that uh, I, I, what I'd written previously said that that film was banned, like, completely, that, that uh, others of Abbas's films were banned in Iran, but that film they wouldn't even let go outside of Iran. Now, it is outside of Iran now, yep. but... That was, you know, that just shows you there have been these different levels of censorship and control. Yeah, the funny thing is they, he made the film that year, he won the first prize of the festival. Right. And then the next year they banned the film. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They, they gave it a prize and then they banned it. Right. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, but that was officially banned. Uh, yes. We, uh, like, Mashq um, homework. Yeah. Um, it wasn't officially banned. Uh, they just didn't watch it. They didn't show it anywhere. They didn't allow it to be shown. No. It's, so the thing is, the Minister of, uh, of Education didn't like the film. And because Kanun is a subsidy of Minister of, uh, of Education, yeah. so this had nothing to do with Ershad, which is usually in charge of giving permission to films. Right. But this was a Kanun film, and Kanun was reporting to Minister of Education, and they didn't like the film, so they said, don't show the film. <laughs> So it's banned differently in a different way. Yeah. Um, we've got about 20 minutes left, so let's open it up to questions from the audiences. Sure. If that's good now. Uh, love to hear what you... Yeah. Um, we just saw the movie, I Make Westerns, and I was curious, um, how, how, did, uh, how did he see them when he was growing up, or, or you when you were growing up in Iran? Was it on television? Was it on movie theaters? And, was the Western genre very popular? Uh, Western? Yeah. I think Western was popular everywhere. Uh, and uh, we actually have a small, very small Q&A um, coming up. It's a, it's a short video that um, HSI is going to put on the website. So you can see a small Q&A with the director. He talks about that film specifically. Uh, but yes, people loved Westerns. Uh, you know, I was seven when the revolution happened, so I, I can't tell you what happened, but I was never, you know, I never watched a Western cinema. But then for many years we had these, um, 
people who would come in and smuggle VHS tapes of films. And we watched everything from like all the Westerns to, I remember I watched Who Framed Roger Rabbit before it was screening in, in the US. Um, so and, we, and before the revolution and after the revolution, right? So this is after the revolution. After so the revolution. It, it didn't stop by the revolution because people would smuggle in films and we would watch all the, all the new films, including... Did the Western have a particular resonance speak, with Iran? Can you speak on the mic? Because we're, okay. we're streaming. Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I should have Does the that. Western have a particular... the genre have particular uh, resonance with, with Iran? Their culture? I don't, again, I was seven. I don't know, but from what I remember, and I remember like names of the films, in Guru Hashem, the, the, um, the Wild Bunch. Wild Bunch. A Wild Bunch, yeah, a Wild Bunch. Like the, the, the translation, the title was in Guru Hashem, and this was a, like, if my father would see like a bunch of kids on the course, he was like, in Guru Hashem, a Wild Bunch. Like it, it was, even names or things from films was referenced. Um, Clint Eastwood was a big name in Iran back then. Again, I was seven, but they knew Clint Eastwood. So, so I, I don't know, but from my experience, I can tell I can tell you that yes, Westerns were big. My first time staying by myself in the Hotel Nadari in downtown uh, Tehran, uh, they had a, a, a TV in the lobby, and the first thing I saw that first night was Shane. On the on TV, and there were there were other other westerns after that, and also there were there was this culture of people who dubbed the voices, like of John Wayne. That guy became a big celebrity, right? Yeah, I'm sorry. That's, so so that's another thing. After the revolution, uh, we only had two TV channels, um, and on Fridays they showed a uh, a feature length a feature film. Usually Friday afternoons. Friday is is equal to Sunday here. Is the end of the week. So they show the film, and they had difficult. I mean, they had a lot of limitations about what they could show. Um, they couldn't show women with like nudity. Of course, they couldn't show that. Westerns, I think, is the type of film that they could easily show there, for many reasons, because there were not a lot of women in westerns. But at the same time, it showed a wild face of uh, image of the West, which. They didn't mind that message. So I remember watching Westerns on TV in Iran after the revolution. They showed those things. And then John Wayne, yeah, they dubbed all the films. Uh, and I have to tell you, some of these films, you watch them again, not just Western, but also comedies. You watch them again in English, they're not funny. <laughs> you watch them in Farsi, they're really funny. <laughs> uh, there was something that we were watching actually a few months ago that um, who was it? Uh, do you remember? But uh, so one of one of the one of the films at the we I tried to find the dubbed version, and, but there was something wrong, and in the middle of it, it would switch to English and go back. There were parts that he was just sitting there looking, saying nothing, but in Farsi, he was saying things nonstop. And it was so so much funnier. <laughs> so I think they added a lot to the films by dubbing it. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So John Wayne's voice, he, yeah. he, I think he earned the fame. <laughs> Actually, I have a question, a follow-up to that. Sure. Did they ever change what they were saying? Did they, they change. Did Sometimes they, uh, they completely change the story. Um, I remember I, I, I watched, um, was it Apollo 13? Apollo 13. Apollo 13, yeah. They, they showed the film, they, they completely changed the story. It was a an anti-American film that how the government's rotten. So they completely rewrote the film. Sometimes they would change the scenes to yeah. I but this a, is after the revolution, not before the revolution. I have a couple of good stories from before the revolution that Harvey Kimniavi told me. One was uh, about uh, Death in Venice by Visconti, and of course you can't have any reference to homosexuality. And so the boy, the, the beautiful blonde boy, they they called him Bridget. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing you can do with dubbing. And then another one, he, I think he told me this story about, or maybe I just read it, about Beckett, the film Beckett. You couldn't have anything about killing the, 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 uh, you know, the monarch or anything, or the, the priest or anything against the royal family. So they changed the, complete, the whole story of, of Beckett uh, in, in, in rewriting the, the voiceovers. So we had that before the revolution, yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, other questions?
I'm going to throw in one okay. more. Um, you know, there was recently a, a program on NPR about cassette culture mm -hmm. and the fact that, and how much influence that had on the revolution because people would take cassettes and record the Ayatollah and then send it over. Yeah. You've gotten me thinking about these, uh, the VHS and the fact that in, in some way, I mean, it's digital analog, it, it was still physical. And I'm just wondering what you see as a change in terms of, of exchange with, uh, you know, I don't know, I hate to say Westies, but, but at least from, from some of the countries outside of Iran to Iran. And is there a change now that it's, we're in such a, a virtual world versus that physical uh, VHS or, or cassette culture? So tapes in general, they played a big role uh, in the revolution and then in keeping culture coming in after the revolution, I would say. Uh, we actually had a very good documentary called VHS Diaries, which was about one of these guys who, who, um, who took VHS films to, to homes. Uh, unfortunately, it's not on. We had a limited license of showing it. Uh, that was a but, big culture when I started going there in the 90s of people ordering uh, VHS cassettes like they order pizza, right? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we, we usually you would subscribe. They would come in like every Tuesday. He would come in with a Samsonite full of these VHS tapes, and you didn't get a choice. I mean, you could only choose from what he had that day. <laughs> and they would, uh, like after a film, would go around for a few months because VHS tapes were expensive. They would record something else on top of that. And one of the fun things was waiting for film to finish and then watch the ending of another film. That it was always a surprise because like one movie was longer than the other one. So you would always wait to see it to the end. And then sometimes you would miss the beginning of it. I remember there was this guy, uh, the, the guy who brought us, which is, he bought us a tape. Uh, and the name of the film, he didn't have the name of the film. For whatever reason, he didn't get the name. He wrote, they uh, kidnapped General's daughter and killed her. Uh, that was the name of the film. And I said, this is the beginning of the film, not the end of the film, right? They don't, they don't kill at the end. He said, no, they kill at the end. So, so you told me the story. What's the point of watching this anymore? <laughs> so you would pick from whatever they had. They usually had 20 films, and then you would get three. And then the next week, they would come in, get the three back. But going back to your question, I think that's a question for everywhere now. It's not just about Iran. I mean. This is the challenge that we have here in America. Um, so I don't have anything to add. I don't know what's going on in Iran, but it's a challenge that I assume people have everywhere. Are there other questions that you can uh, add, just ask at the mic there? And if there are any questions from people uh, who are watching online, please do send them in. And please just go right ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this. this is a wonderful session, and I'm definitely going to become a member of DocuNight. Um, my question is about your experience of the documentaries. Are they allowed to be critical uh, at all, or are they heavily censored? The reason I ask the question is that I've just recently came back from Iran, and I speak Farsi with a slight accent. And so I don't know whether it's because of that. Every single person I came across uh, was very critical of the regime and everything else. And I don't know whether they were critical because I was a foreigner in their mind or whether that's prevalent. So I wondered in your watching the documentaries, is it easier to be critical now than it used to be? So I think people have always been critical. I mean, if you write a cap, you get people's opinion and they criticize everything all the time. Uh, I think it was the same in, during the Shah and yeah. same after the revolution. Uh, I don't think that's anything new. Uh, watching in the films, um, I think because you don't, it's cheaper to make films, digital. I don't have to go through the, all the problems that, you, that were there before to getting permission and all of that. It's easier to get films that are, um, I wouldn't just say critical, like anything that doesn't fit in the frame that they have usually. For them, it's easier to make those films, but then it's more difficult to show them. 
And of course, you can always send it outside and show that if it's a good film. But then if it's too sensitive, then you're going to have limitations making films inside after that. So it's always, it's an art. And I would say it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, of course, there's so many bad things about it. And I know that if you just take this part out, it's going to be completely out of context. But it helps people be more creative. Uh, when you say something very bold and direct in face, it's, it's activism. When you say it with, which is not a bad thing, but it's, it's activism. When you say it with art and find creative way of saying it, when you, when you say it with creativity, it becomes art. And I think it lasts longer. Sometimes you have to be an activist. Sometimes you have to be an artist. Uh, some people are activists, some people are artists. So it depends on which way you want to go. But I think these limitations make people more creative. And the end result lasts longer. Like you look at Kamran Shirdel's films, which were very critical of the situation back then, before the revolution. You can still watch them. They still have things to say. It's still interesting. Um, but you see other things that are very powerful in, in an activist way. They're kind of irrelevant now when you look at them because problems are not there anymore. We, have a, we are dealing with a different kind of problems. So the film become uh, irre irrelevant. Thank you. Thank you. Another question? Any other questions? I'll ask one more of you. I was curious to uh, know about. Uh, you produced, you were working as a producer on Coup 53. Uh, what did you learn in doing that about documentary filmmaking? Um, that was a very special film. Yeah. Uh, in for many reasons. Um, it took 10 years from Tari to yeah. make the film. Yeah. And the amount of passion and energy that he had to put in that film, yeah. I, I don't think any, I don't think that many people can, uh, can do such work. Right. Uh, and then he was so passionate that he would get people involved in film that normally wouldn't get involved. Like the, the editor of that film is Walter Murch. Um, if you know cinema, I'm sure you know Walter Murch. Um, he's the probably the most famous film editor in the history of cinema. Yeah. Maybe he did Godfathers. Yeah. He kind of invented, you can correct me wrong, the 5.1 Dolby sound. Yeah. Uh, so getting him to edit a film about uh, Iranian documentary is not an easy, <laughs> easy thing. But uh, so I don't know if I can, ex I can say that is the usual way of doing things in documentary. But there, there's one saying that I love. So it's fiction film. Director is God. In uh, in documentaries, God is a director <laughs> because you start, but you never know where you're going to end up and That's what you find. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and my experience in making a couple of documentaries is that it really does take, take just incredible determination and you know, stick-to-itiveness to get to the end. You just have to keep going, keep going, keep going, no matter what. Yeah, he, and, uh, Godfrey has a, a documentary, uh, Moving Midway. Yeah, about my family's about plantation. His, yeah, you know. his family's plantation. It's a, it's a fun... That just took fun. forever. And I, I tell documentary filmmakers, just one piece of advice I have is to pray for miracles because it always takes several miracles to get to the end of the road. I think the most important thing is, so unlike feature films, I think documentaries are made uh, in the editing room. Yes. You go in without having a specific story. If you have a specific story, it's not a good documentary. Yeah, yeah. So you go in, so editor's job is very, very important. And I think exactly. it's important that for the director not to edit this film. Yeah. Well, I, in my experience, I have to work with the editor, but I have to let the editor be the editor. Yes. Yeah, you need somebody and you have to let things go because... Uh, I, I find that this part of the documentary filmmaking is very interesting to me, uh, that you go study about a topic. And usually film directors, who, they become the, one of the most um, people who know knowledgeable people about that topic, whatever the topic is, because they spend a few years working on it. And then you do interviews, you do different things. And then you end up with six hours. You have to cut it down to two hours, an hour and a half, or an hour. And then at some point where it gets to like two hours, two hour, two hour and a half, it's very difficult to cut it any shorter. And you have to 
cut out big chunks of the film. Uh, that will become very difficult for directors to do it. It is, because you That's have the challenge that we had with Ku-53 as well, because you know how much important the story is, and uh, you spend a lot of time finding it and filming it and editing it. It's not easy to let it go, but if you have somebody next to you to push you, to force you to let it go, then you're going to have a tighter, better film. Yeah, that, that's that's really true, and you have to let go of some of your favorite moments and your favorite scenes and everything like that, just yeah. to, to get the story where the story needs to be. Yeah. And the storytelling all does happen in the in the editing room, and yeah. the writing of a documentary happens after the film, you know, which is completely counterintuitive versus the narrative where you make sense that you write the film and then you go shoot it. In the in the documentary, you go shoot it and then you figure out how to how write to it. say it. Yeah, yeah, how to say it. Uh, have you got any more ambitions or thoughts about making another documentary or getting involved in more documentary production? Um, maybe. I've been actually thinking about making a documentary myself for a, for a while. Um, not because I'm... I, I, you know, I made this decision many years ago that I don't want to make films. I want to yeah. stay out of it. But So not because I'm passionate about making documentaries. That's a great job, but I thought I would never do it. But it's a topic, it's somebody that I very much um, admire. Uh, and he, um, he's dealing with Alzheimer's. I wow. think his story needs to be told. It's a very important story. In this world that everything is black and white and polarized, he's, the, he's, he's somebody who uh, sacrificed everything, his family, risks his family, his, um, his life, literally, yeah. uh, to go the other way and look at things uh, like on a gray scale, right. not not black and white. Is this person Iranian? Is this an Iranian no, story? No, uh, he's he's Italian. He lives uh, actually in a, uh, a place in Connecticut now. Uh -huh. He used to work for the UN. He's the guy. So I'll tell you just the beginning of it, and then I'm not going to hold you here <laughs> hostage, which is relevant to the story. This is. Uh, I went to this conference, and there was this tall Italian guy, very handsome. Um, one of the first things that he said was, I ended Iran-Iraq war. I'm like, what the hell is he talking about? Like, <laughs> like one person, like I ended. I'm like, he's crazy. And then he started telling stories, and all the stories made sense. But I couldn't believe it. So I had to go... Uh, I researched the guy, and I learned that he was telling the story. He single-handedly ended Iran-Iraq war, which is a, I understand, it's a very big claim that I'm making right here. But uh, he, he's the person responsible for ending, ending Iran-Iraq war. Uh, his title was peacemaker. He worked for the UN. Um, his name is uh, Dr. Gian Domenico Pico. Um, and then later on, of course, nobody knows about this part of the story. But then the second part, people know about the story, don't know him. Uh, if you lived in the U.S. or in the West, you may remember the hostage situation in Lebanon and in late 80s and early 90s. Um, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon took hostage, uh, took several Western uh, journalists hostage from the U.S. and from Germany and the U.K. Um, he went and offered himself as a hostage to, the, to Hezbollah and negotiated uh, with number two at Hezbollah, Ahmad Mughnia, uh, negotiated uh, in a way like he was stripped down naked, just underwear, blindfolded, hands tied to his chair, negotiated the release of these people. And he did, each time he went, he came back with two people, and went in again, and he did it several times. Um, and it's not about the political side of it, I'm not interested in politics, but the the way he talks about people and humanity and the world and why he did it. Um, Ahmad Mounir, again number two at Hezbollah, uh, they ask, asks him that, why are you here? This has nothing to do with you. You're Christian Italian. There's a war between us and the United States and Israel. What does it have to do with you? And he says, um, he said that I was sitting there thinking that the way I answer this is going to decide the fate of myself and these seven hostages. Um, and I have to understand that I'm translating from Italian to English. He's in his way, he's translating from English to Arabic. Uh, so whatever I say has to go through all of this. And at the same time, I have to be honest. 
And he says, I'm sitting here, uh, I'm paying forward for my son. I said, what do you mean? He said, a year ago, if somebody had asked, what are the chances of me sitting here in front of you, talking to you about something? Uh, what was it, like 0.0001%? I said, okay. He said, there's that much chance that someday your son might be able to uh, save my son. I'm paying for that. Um, and then he has no money. Nobody knows him. People have forgotten him. And, I, and when you learn about the details of the story, it was quite moving for me personally. So I think it's a story that should be told, and I hope I can make it. It's not an easy thing because he has Alzheimer's. He doesn't remember anything anymore. And he's young. He's 72 years old. Oh, wow. Very healthy physically. But, uh, so it is difficult. You cannot have... And many of these things happen beyond closed doors, like conversations with Saddam Hussein, for example. Yeah. Uh, anyways, this this took too long, but this well, is... that sounds like a really good film. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm passionate about this. <laughs> no. I'm a completely lost track of time. I think that was a great place to end up, in a way. Well, I think this has been a fabulous conversation, um, and I want to thank you again for curating this series because what we didn't get a chance to talk about was, so you think you know Iran? What is this kind of aggregate of perspectives? And I also see it in conjunction with the exhibition that we have downstairs because, again, we're having the vision of contemporary artists who are also envisioning a, a world in different ways. So it's those layers of interpretation that I think become so powerful, whether it's in the medium of cinema or, or the medium of visual arts or in the medium of, of uh, music, which is one that I'm quite passionate about. So I want to thank you for, for being a part of of this series and, and helping really think about this, for keeping all of the uh, filmmakers in Iran for these films engaged. So one of the things that's been exciting is that although we're here in New York City, this is being tweeted and uh, Facebooked and YouTubed out to the world and will be online but available to people uh, and to these very same filmmakers in Iran. So I want to thank you both, and I want to thank all of you for being here today. Yeah. Rachel, I want to also say that, you know, that these people, they make films because they care about the topic and what they do. And I'm very happy that we were able to give these films, limited number of films, uh, a new audience, a new stage, because it's very difficult to show documentaries anywhere. It's not just for Iranians, like any documentary filmmaker has that, that challenge. And I'm grateful for that, uh, for you helping me. And one thing that we discussed at the beginning, we went through a lot of discussions every Thursday um, about the topics that we covered, because we wanted to cover different topics. But there's so many other topics that we didn't have a chance uh, and I hope that in the future we, we get to cover those as well in, in, in the part two or part three of these series. I look forward to that. And, and I do want to say, I, I want you to subscribe to DocuNite. But I also want you to join the Asia Society because the Asia Society's goal is to be able to share just these stories. And of course, we're a not-for-profit and, uh, and we try to pre create a platform in which multiple views come together in a, in a three-dimensional way. So we have policy programs, but I think unlike other think tanks, uh, we bring in the arts and we bring in the creative people. And very much what you just said, which had to do with all the metaphors that you come up with to tell stories in we're all in some ways in restrictive situations where there are censors, whether they're self-censors or, or others in our society. And so finding other ways to tell that story is really important. And I agree, that's the longevity. The longevity is finding those other ways so those stories become relevant, not just to tomorrow, but on into the future. Anyway, thank you. Join the Asia Society and DocuNite, and thank you very much. <laughs>